insane of Deborah Clayton. Yes, he was insane at the time of the uh, shooting of, of Lieutenant Clayton. That's all the questions I have, Judge. All right, thank you, Mr. Norman. Frost. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Dr. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Why don't we start with the easy stuff to make sure it's clear? I'm sorry, I, I... Can we start with the easy stuff to make sure it's clear? Mm -hmm. Can you explain to the jury the two prongs of insanity yes. under Florida law? Yes. What's the first prong? The first prong of insanity under Florida law. Yes. What is it? I'm asking you what it is. Oh, okay. Because I don't think it was clear what it was. So please oh, tell the members uh, of the that first there's a, the person has a mental illness, and that the person did not know uh, what he was doing was wrong or its consequences. Okay. Now I heard you give Mr. Lenneman a recitation of what Mr. Lloyd told you mm -hmm. about the incidents at the Walmart. Do you remember yes. giving him that? Yes. Okay. But Mr. Lloyd told you that he didn't remember what happened, right? Yes. Okay. So where is that coming from? If Mr. Lloyd told you he didn't remember the incident, then where are you giving us this recitation from? Oh, that no, he, that came from him. Okay, well, you did previously say that, you had, that he had no memory of the incident. Right, but we re re revisited the, the oh, issue. Oh, you revisited we talked, the incident. We, well, we were talking about it all along. That's, that is the undercurrent of the entire evaluation. So, so that I understand, mm -hmm. the first time Mr. Lloyd told you he didn't have any memory of the incident? That's correct. And then later on, he remembered what happened? I believe so, yes. I believe that's how it how When it you say later on, do you mean like... Months, days, weeks? No, no, you, you have to understand how the, how the process unfolds. Uh, hold on, Mr. Dr. Toomer, uh -huh. respectfully, you've described the process several times now. So can you tell me how many weeks or months between your conversations with Mr. Lloyd was it that he went from not remembering what happened to telling you what happened? That's my point. You're misrepresenting what I said. Then what I'm saying, it. what I'm saying is you don't understand the dynamic. It wasn't a matter of weeks or months. I saw him on two separate occasions. And what happens in the process is that initially when I go in, I'm not trusted. I mean, why should, why should you trust me? So we have to establish some, some rapport. And initially as we go through and we were talking about, uh, various things and then we go back for the, another visit and as we go through we are we are uh, dealing with the issue at hand and eventually he, he indicates what transpired so mr well you still didn't answer my question how long was it between your two meetings with mr lloyd uh 829 19 yes, and 316 20. So he had a chance to think about it for approximately seven months. August of 19. 19 to 3, 16, 20. Yeah, March of 20. March, yeah, March 16, 2020. Okay. Now, Mr. Lenneman asked you about some Facebook posts that you reviewed. Do you remember those questions? Yes. And you gave us an example about how when people laugh, sometimes that external act is not representative of what's going on. Right. Right. And that you were, you were also describing that there's Mr. F Mr. Lloyd's Facebook posts demonstrated a lack of logic. Yes. Right. Now, did you specifically review some Facebook posts where he talked about the murder of law enforcement officers? Mm, I did. I just don't recall at this moment. Okay. Yes. So those didn't hold any significance to you? Which, what are you referring to in terms of? You are aware, mm -hmm. am I right, that yes. Mr. Lloyd posted things about the murder of law enforcement officers? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. right. Overruled. And that following that post, he talked about killing police officers, right? Objection. Overruled. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I don't remember him talking about killing police officers, but about the death of police officers, yes. Would looking at the Facebook post help you remember, sir? 
Yes, I just don't remember That's that fine. specific line at this particular well, point. Before I show them to you, <clears throat> could you answer this question, which mm -hmm. is, if you don't remember them, would you agree that they weren't very significant in reaching your opinion? No, I would not agree with that. Okay. So you don't remember what is significant and what is not when reaching your opinion? Uh, not if you're going to take point by point. I'm saying okay. to you that overall his Facebook postings uh, were significant and overall they represented in terms of what was positive there. He represented his delusional system that we have described. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. And to, to, I'm handing you States Exhibit 53. Mm -hmm. and I'd like you to look specifically at page 475 and then the following page. Mm -hmm. Look at the article that he posts. I'm sorry, Mr. Lerman, sure. I apologize. Yes, sir. So the first two pages, and actually those are the only real relevant pages mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about. Just take a look at them and read the post follow, and just look up when you're finished so I can know you're done. Please. Is there something you want on the cover sheet? You want yes, sir. Look at the title of the article, what it describes. Oh, I did, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Then the second page is actually his post. Okay. Well, I take that back. There is a post from him at the bottom of that page below. Have you had a chance to review them? Yes. Now, in those posts, Mr. Lloyd is talking about, in part, the history of racism in this country. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you said that was a theme with, correct? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and he draws a direct line in this post from that history of racism to the need to kill police officers. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Well, I, I, you see, when I read that, I did not see it as a, a need to kill police officers. What he was saying was, he says that if police officers kill uh, blacks, then I'm going to take some of them with me. Uh, that's what I saw in, in that particular post. Okay. We'll go with your interpretation for a moment. That's still a direct line from racism in America and police officer misbehavior to we kill them, to officers being killed. It's a logical conclusion he's making, right? Racism in America. I'm Give right. me your, your line right. again. Sure. He's taking a wrong that has been done to his people and his belief, uh -huh. right? And he's drawing from that line, he's drawing a line to police officers need to die. Well, as, as I said to you, it, what I saw in that was him saying that if police officers are going to kill black people, then... Then they should be killed. Uh, he said, take, he says, I'm going to take some with me, some to that effect. That's what that's what he was saying. And Not by taking them with me, he means they should die. Uh, yes, but it, but as you are mm -hmm. insinuating that he's just saying, well, let's just go out and and kill them. But it doesn't really matter because it's all part of the delusional system that he has with regard to to what has transpired and how he figures into that context. I wanted to ask you also on two separate occasions, you referenced Mr. Lloyd's belief that he was falsely accused of a crime. That's yes, that's what he indicated. And, and yes. what circumstance are you referring to? I believe it was, um, I have to check, I believe it was, was it 1995 
Okay. It was a 1995 case, I believe. And so you took his word that he was falsely accused? That's what he indicated, yes. Did you ever try to figure out if he was, in fact, falsely accused? I believe I saw something. But you see, the thing is this. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me, if you could answer yes or no and then explain I, I did. I just, did. I, I, okay. I, I, I believe that that was, that was the case that he was, that he was talking about. And my understanding is that he was, uh, that he was exonerated or what have you in that particular case. And where does that understanding come from? I had, I've had so many records. I, somewhere in some of the, the documents when I went back all the way to, to try to develop a timeline. You're of sure history. it's not just for Mr. Lloyd? I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sure. But, it, it, but you see, the, the issue is that when you are dealing with someone who is mentally ill, it's not so much the truth as we see it. It's how the person views it. The person who is schizophrenic and hears voices. Dr. Toomer? I'm, I'm just trying to explain. You I, asked but the you question. answered my question. Overruled. Hold on. You answered my question, so let's listen for the next question, okay? I'm trying to explain my answer. Yes, sir. And you've done that on several no, occasions. No, I haven't. Overruled. All right. Let me see the attorney's sideboard. You make it. <coughs> you still have enough water up there, Dr. Timmer? I'm, I'm fine. Thank okay. you. Um, your testimony in this case is in the area of forensic psychology. Is that right? Clinical and forensic psychology. Clinical and forensic psychology. Yes. Uh, and what area is your PhD in? My PhD is in social psychology. Is it social and group processes? Social and group processes, yes. Okay. Well, that's not social psychology. It's social and group processes. No, right? it's social. I'm sorry. That's overruled. Go ahead. It's social psychology. Okay. Yes. But you didn't tell the members of the jury that your PhD wasn't in forensic psychology. Objection. I can't hear you when you're sitting down. What? Objection. He's commenting and testifying. Rephrase your question, Mr. Williams. You did not tell your, the members of the jury that your PhD was not in forensic psychology, did you, Dr. Toomer? No, there was no, there was no program in existence in forensic psychology when I earned my, my degree, my PhD degree in uh, 1973. I completed a year's, uh, I completed my PhD in social psychology. I then completed a year's postdoc residency uh, at Albert Einstein Hospital in Philadelphia. And you told the members of the jury that you're board certified, right? Board certified in, in organizational psychology, yes. Right. So you're not board certified in forensic or clinical psychology, are you? No. They, at the time that I, I was board certified, they had not yet moved to a single designation. I'm a member of, the, of what is, is known as the American Academy of Board Certified Psychologists. We were psychologists who were board certified when you had to be where you, where you had to develop, uh, show, develop and show and demonstrate uh, special, highly specialized knowledge in all areas of psychology. At that time, forensic psychology was known as legal psychology, but we had to demonstrate competency in all areas. It was a two and a half day examination process, uh, both uh, oral and written. Nowadays, since that time, they have reconfigured the board certification process and they've broken it down into specific, specific areas. But at the time, uh, the area that was called legal psychology was simply one of a number of areas in which I had to demonstrate advanced competence. But you would agree that you told the members of the jury you were going to testify. Overrule. You would agree that you told the members of the jury that you were going to testify on clinical and forensic psychology, right? 
That's what I specialize in, yes. Right. But we just established that that's not what your board certification is in. That's, right? That is, board certification has nothing to do with what you, the area in which you practice. And what I'm saying is you have people who are practicing in forensic psychology who never sat for boards. So that doesn't keep them from, from uh, practicing in the area of clinical and forensic wasn't psychology. Wasn't that your attempt to bolster your credibility with yes. this jury? Overruled. Uh, I, I don't need to bolster <laughs> my credibility. My credibility is well established. Now, I would assume you would say that gen it's generally important for psychologists. That what is? It is generally important oh, okay. for psychologists such as yourself to mm -hmm. remain objective when reaching conclusions on criminal cases like this one. That is right? correct, yes. Um, particularly in the context of a first degree murder case where the death penalty is possible. Oh, that is correct, definitely. And you've testified in a number of cases like this one, correct? Yes, mm-hmm. And I believe close to 100 is the estimate that uh, you've given. Not like this, no. Okay, how many capital murder cases have you testified? Oh. Approximately, even if that's the case. I, I, I don't know, Prob probably, say I've been practicing over 25 years probably, I'd say maybe 50, 100, I, I, I really have okay. absolutely no idea. All right, well, regardless, you cannot recall a single instance where you've testified on behalf of the state of Florida as an expert, right? I can't recall, but I have, but it's been a long time ago. The most recent uh, case in which I was retained by the state was with you. And so that's the, that's the most recent pre-COVID, but nothing has happened since that time. Yes, sir. You didn't testify in that case, though, did you? Uh, no, you, you, you and your investigator contacted me about testifying on behalf of the state uh, in a case. And you were never called? I was never called. It was COVID, so I don't know what happened. Right. But that was, that was the last that I've heard. When I testify for the state, <clears throat> Long time uh, ago, according to you. Uh, yes, but when I do testify for the state, I, I'm usually testifying uh, in issues regarding, uh, regarding competence, Miranda, sometimes pro se, uh, but that's what happens. And your current rate per hour is what? The state rate. Which is what? Which is 250 an hour. Now, as of December of 2020, when I deposed you, you had uh, earned about $4,000 for your testimony on behalf of um, Mr. Lloyd. Is that right? I believe so. I, I, if that's what I indicated, I, I just don't recall right offhand. Right. And do you know how much you've earned since then? I beg your pardon? How much money you've earned testifying on behalf of Mr. Lloyd since December of 2020? How much have you billed? Nothing. You haven't billed anything? No. Do you plan on billing something? At some point, yes. Okay, so let's not be cute about it. No, no, I'm just saying, you, you asked Williams. a specific time, Hold on, and I answered. Mr. Williams, no. All right, rephrase your question. How much money do you intend on making off of Mr. Lloyd's case for your testimony? I have no idea. No idea? Uh -huh. I hadn't even thought about it. Okay. And... You do have a moral objection to the death penalty, right, Dr. Toomer? Oh, I have, I have a moral objection, uh, as I've indicated, yes, but that it has nothing to do with how I practice. I practice and I testify as it relates to the, uh, to the issues at hand and to the law. Now, did you obtain information about this case from any sources other than Mr. Lloyd? Just the people that, just the sources that I mentioned. Okay, so we know you read Takesha Bryant's testimony, right? I did, yes. That was provided. Uh, did, you, did you read any police reports? Uh, yes, I read the, uh, the lead detective's report. Uh, that was a supplemental. Uh, and I also, I didn't read the, read the reports. I, I watched the videos of, the, of Mr. Lloyd's appearances in court. Okay. Now, I, I believe you re referenced the DSM-5 on direct examination. Correct, yes. Right? And you agreed that it's an authoritative text in the field of psychology and psychiatry. Oh, by all right. means, yes. Right. And <clears throat> you also testified on direct that you reviewed the reports of several other defense experts, right? Yes, that is correct. 
And that would include um, Dr. Sesta? Yes. Right? And you reviewed the port of, report of Dr. Mayer, Michael Mayer? That's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, you re reviewed the report of Dr. Campbell? Uh, yes. And you reviewed the report of Dr. Dunn? Uh, yes. And you relied on some of their findings in reaching your conclusions, correct? Uh, that is correct, yes. And you would agree that they all used the DSM-5 and its criteria in reaching their conclusions, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yet, you did not actually check the criteria for the mental illnesses that you say Mr. Lloyd has, right? Uh, would you repeat that question again? Sure. And we'll, we'll back up to explain it. Mm -hmm. The DSM-5, and I have a copy here, mm -hmm. is a manual that has all the mental illnesses, or most of the major mental illnesses listed in the field yes. of psychiatry and psychology, right? You have your yes. copy? I have my copy, yes. Perfect. Right, now you referred to it as an overview. Right? What's that? You refer to the DSM-5 as an overview. Did no, I, I don't refer that? to it as the authors refer to it as that. All right. But you would agree that the DSM-5 lists specific criteria for each and every mental illness that's described within it. Yes, but the criteria listed is not an exhaustive criteria. And does it, it say that in there? What's that? Does it say that in yes, there? Yes, it does. It okay. says, it's, first of all, the DSM-5 uh, according to the, the new, this new version, uh, is not an exhaustive listing of categories of mental illness, and it is not an exhaustive listing of uh, diagnostic criteria, in other words, symptomatology. It also indicates that the reason for that is that the symptomatology with respect to mental illness uh, cuts across many different mental illnesses. In other words, you can have the same, the criteria for it. For example, a symptom of bipolar disorder can also be a symptom for schizophrenia. That's one component of that. Then the other, the other part is that there is data from other sources, for example, that provide information relevant to the diagnostic categories in the DSM-5. Uh, yes. let, let me give you an example. But, but the, the specific criteria are listed in the DSM-5 that have to be met for a diagnosis. Right, but it is not an exhaustive okay, so list. Listen, listen to my question, please. Mm -hmm. Did you look at the criteria for each of the mental illnesses you say Mr. Lloyd had? I did, yes. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Mm -hmm. Now, you, I believe, testified that he had, according to you, <clears throat> schizophrenia. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. And bipolar? Yes. Right? And uh, PTSD? Yes. And psychosis? Yes. And neurocognitive disorder? Yes. These are, these are the diagnostic symptomatology of this, that I found with Mr. Lloyd. Okay. Now, you would agree with me that psychosis is not a mental illness recognized in the DSM-5? No. When we, when we say psychosis, psychosis tends to be a kind of global term that speaks to the significance of a particular mental illness. Usually when people are psychotic, there is a break with reality. In other words, they are not testing reality as people normally would. So the term psychosis is a reflection of that, of that particular behavior, given the mental illness. Yes, but Mr. Lenneman asked you which mental illnesses Mr. Lloyd suffered from, and you said, quote, psychosis. Well, I, I was trying to give a, a picture of his overall mental status functioning, yes. So, once again, you would agree that psychosis is not a specific mental illness diagnosable in DSM-4? Well, it's, it's not considered in terms of the, you know, we talk about psychosis oh, and hold neurosis. Hold on, Dr. Tumor, if you could say yes or no. I did. Explain. I don't think you did, sir. I did. I answered your question. Okay. Is it recognized, psychosis, under the DSM-5 as a specific mental illness? No, it's, it's, not, a, it's no. not a specific okay. mental illness. If you'd like to explain now, please go ahead. No, I was just saying, we, the term psychosis, you have, usually have neurosis and psychosis. Uh, everybody is somewhat neurotic. We all have our own neuroses. When you move along the continuum to psychosis, you're talking about, as I indicated earlier, a break with reality, an individual who is out of touch with reality. 
And so that's where Mr. Lloyd fits in terms of the overall continuum. Now, you also said that Mr. Lloyd suffers from delusional disorder. Yes. And that is recognized by the DSM-5, correct? Yes. Right. And you relied heavily on Dr. Sesta's report for that diagnosis, correct? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Sesta went through the criteria in his report for delusional disorder under the DSM-5, correct? Right? Um, do you know what the specific criteria are for, the del for delusional disorder for DSM-5? Uh, I don't know them off, off hand, but I know that they're there. Did you double check them to see if they met? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. You did? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when I deposed you back in 2020, you couldn't tell me what the, del what the criteria were for delusional disorder. I still can't today. Not, by, not from memory. <clears throat> Now, <coughs> defense counsel described a delusion as a fixed false belief, right? Yes. And you agreed with that definition. Correct? What's that? You agreed with that definition, A right? fixed false belief. Yes, sir. In spite not of, amenable to change despite the evidence. Yeah, not amenable to change in spite of evidence to the contrary. Okay. And if I understand your testimony correctly, the delusion that you're testifying Mr. Lloyd was under at the time of this murder mm -hmm. was that the police were out to get him. Yes. Right. But isn't it true that at the time of this murder, it's a fact that the police were out to get him? Mr. Lloyd's view was that they were out to kill him, not to get him, to kill him. Right. It just so happens that that was true at the time of this murder, right? Oh, I didn't, according to Mr. L I don't know if that was true. I didn't know if the police were out to kill him. I you don't know if it was true that Mr. Lloyd was wanted for murder when he committed this crime? Yes, That's not the question you ask. Do you know that Mr. Lloyd was wanted for first degree murder when he killed Lieutenant Clayton? Of course. Okay. But, I, so but it, you, it you, is true by nature that the police were trying to find him, out to get him at the time of this crime, right? But were the police out to kill him? Well, you said get him. I didn't know. Mr. Mr. Lloyd's belief was that the police were out to kill him. That was his belief. Do you remember previously giving a deposition in this case? I'm sorry? Do you remember previously giving a deposition in this case to yes. me in December of 2020? Correct. And do you recall telling me that the delusion was that the police were out to get him? Well, that, that was the... It, you see, when you talk about the delusion, the delusion was it was both, it went back and forth. His delusion was that they're going to kill him. And sometimes he would say they'd get him, kill him, whatever. His belief was that the police were going to kill him. That's what he told his brother uh, when he spoke to his brother. That's what he told his sister. So he, he has communicated to kill him uh, more than just now, but for a long time. And that's why we don't go with the totality of the right. data because we go back. So this isn't just something that just started. This, is, this has been there, so if and Mr. it has Lloyd, been that they're, killing, sorry, they're there to kill him. So if Mr. Lloyd were under a long-term delusion that the police were out to get him, or excuse me, kill him, mm -hmm. to use your words, then you would expect him to have negative interactions with police all the time when he came in contact with them, right? Not necessarily. It would depend on the context and what was, what was going on. In other words, whether or not he had committed a crime or not? No. No. In terms of how, in terms of how, the interaction took place between he and the and the police. So he's only scared of police when, what? Explain explain that to me. You're saying that it, di it differs on the context. So yeah. when is it that Mr. Lloyd is fearful of police, and when is it that he's not? He's always. Right. Okay. So if he's always fearful of police. We know in this situation that his fear, according to you, led him to shoot another police officer, right? Yes. Right. So we would expect his, him his to shoot let me, another let me, police officer. Well, let, let Come me, on, let me finish my question. Mm -hmm. According to your logic, we would expect him to shoot police officers when he came to contact with them if this delusion has been going on for a long time, right? No, no. no. Because what you, you misstated the, the, the obvious. Uh, the, the idea of Mr. Lloyd's belief system that the police were out to kill him. It's not just the fact that he interacts with the police. 
It's the context. It's the, per the fact that we have an individual with a mental illness. It's the fact that we have an individual who is not basically processing information uh, as a rational person would that the incidents occur as they do because that is the, that's the critical factor. The critical factor is how the situation is viewed by an individual who is suffering the mental illness that we have described and has been for a long time characterized by the fixed delusional system. So you would agree that you are aware of instances where Mr. Lloyd had interactions with law enforcement that were not negative or uh, let alone violent, right? Oh, I'm, I'm sure he has, yes. Well, you're aware of them, aren't you? Yes, I'm, I'm sure he has, yes. The robberies, the chicken robberies that happened right before? Uh, yeah, he was robbed, yes. Right. And that he contacted police or police were contacted. Yes. And he spoke to them without problem. Sure. Right? Are you aware that he was in traffic stops with his brother? Did, he, did his brother tell you about that? Yes, but I, I, don't, I don't get the link that you're, that you're trying to make. That Mr. Lloyd was perfectly calm during the traffic stop, according to his brother. Well, I, but I think you, what, the, the, what the part that you're missing is that a person who is schizophrenic or a person who is mentally ill or what have you, how that person responds is not going to be exactly the same each and every time. But the overriding and the persistent uh, delusion that has characterized his behavior and influenced his behavior over time has been that the police were going to kill him. Would you also agree with me, Dr. Toomer, that the overtly negative interactions that Mr. Lloyd had with law enforcement throughout his life was when he was violating the law? Well, the, I understand from the, from the records that I've read that, yes, he has violated the law uh, over time while he was, you know, before this particular, this particular incident. And specifically, when he did that and law enforcement tried to enforce the law, he had negative interactions with him, right? Uh, he had negative interactions, but, those, but the perceptions, that's why we look at the totality of the data, the perceptual deficits in terms of how he looked at the police and how he viewed that started a long time ago. It didn't just start with negative images of the police. It didn't start with negative, with less than, it didn't start at a time prior to, uh, prior to the, this current situation. It you started also, a long time ago. You also said that you diagnosed Mr. Lloyd with Neurocognitive disorder? Uh, neurocognitive disorder, yes. Right, and then you broke it down for the members of the jury that that's uh, brain damage. Yeah, it's, 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 it's suggested brain damage, yes. Okay, and you would agree that brain damage often requires uh, looking at scans of some sort, CT scans, head scans, MRIs? Yes. Right. And you didn't do that in this case, right? No, I, didn't, I did not do that, no. That's, and, why I, that's why I indicated when I answered that uh, provisionally, because uh, I did not do that. Because you relied on Dr. Sesta's report for that, right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Because Dr. Sesta is a neuropsychologist, right? That, that is correct. And yes. he did neuropsychological testing on the defendant, correct? That's correct, yes. And he found, isn't it true, that... If there was brain damage, it had no effect on Mr. Lloyd's behavior. I'm sorry, repeat that, please. Dr. Stessa's conclusion that mm -hmm. you relied upon is that if Mr. Lloyd has brain damage, it had no impact on his behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. In fact, he said that there was no residual effect or neurological trauma that he could find in Mr. Lloyd. Right? I believe so, yes. <clears throat> you also testified that Mr. Lloyd, in your opinion, suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Correct. And again, you relied upon the diagnosis of another expert for that opinion. No. All right. Did you evaluate... I'm sorry, go ahead. In part, yes. In part. Did you evaluate the criteria in the DSM-5 when it came to your diagnosis of PTSD? 
I not only did I, and this is what I alluded to earlier when you asked me about the five, I not only looked at the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, but I also looked at the research that's been done and the work that's been widely published over the last 15 or 20 years that focuses on the impact of, of uh, persistent exposure to stress and its impact on the brain and impact on subsequent functioning. That's, so, that was part of my, that's part of what went into my, my uh, conclusion. Would you agree that one of the criteria for PTSD on the DSM-5 is that you identify a specific trauma? Mm -hmm, yes. And yet, you can't identify a specific trauma that is the source of Mr. Lloyd's PTSD, right? You don't have to, see, if you get locked into the DSM-5 and you start looking at it like a checklist, you get locked into just the conclusion that you reached. Are you because let me finish. Sure. When you talk about what you know the the particular criteria, uh, that is that is that criteria is found in the DSM-5. However, when you look at post-traumatic stress disorder, that is not just the the only dynamic that's involved in the. Uh, in the diagnosis that is a particular stress. There is a phenomenon that is referred to as toxic stress, repetitive stress, and persistent stress. And that has come from the fact that most of the times people, when they talk about a trauma, they think about a one incident kind of situation. What I'm talking about when we talk about PTSD is repetitive, when the stressors are repetitive, such as individuals who serve in in, uh, in war settings, where they are exposed to trauma each and every day, such as Mr. Lloyd, by virtue of domestic violence, instability, lack of predictability, lack of safety, lack of sameness, all of these stressors, poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of the, these are persistent stressors that are very much a part of the diagnostic phenomenon. But if you get locked into the DSM-5 without clinical training, you wind up trying to use it as a checklist, and that's a no-no. Do you know why, one of the reasons why the DSM-5 was created yes. for forensic use? Yes. And one of the reasons is to get the language right, serve as a check on ungrounded speculation about mental disorders. Uh, right? That's correct, yes. Right, so they lay out specific criteria to ensure that people, I presume experts, because this is written for experts, don't just speculate about what a diagnosis is. Exactly, right? precisely. But to you, the specific criteria they're laying out to avoid that is not all that important. No, it is important, but, okay. the, but it's also important that you go beyond the DSM-5. You don't get locked into it I, I'm not by using a checklist. I'm asking if you went through the specific criteria. I went through the criteria, yes. Okay, and one of the, the first criteria is that there is a specific traumatic event. Right. And you can't tell me what the specific traumatic event was for Mr. Lloyd. Because, the, because if you understand the DSM-5, you wouldn't even be asking that question. Okay. You would be asking what was the, tra the source of the trauma, not what, what was the one specific event. And toxic stress is not in the DSM-5 e either, is it? Toxic stress is not Hold on, a... answer my question, please. Yes no, no, toxic no. stress okay. is a phenomenon. It's simply a term that's used and it came about probably 20, 25 years ago to account for people who have repetitive stress, such as, as I mentioned, people who serve in war zones or what have you. Because most of the time when we think of trauma and stress, we think of a one-time incident where a person is in, you know, I don't know, man-made or Trump or nature made like a terrible hurricane or tsunami, we think of one incident. But what we're talking about here is what's called toxic stress, persistent stress, repetitive stress. They're all the same thing, and they're all used in the literature in the same way. And so now, if you, you have that knowledge, on. you don't get hung up with a single stressor. You also said that Mr. Lloyd suffers from schizophrenia, right? Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you used a different term when I spoke to you mm -hmm. in December of 2020. What, what, different, what different term? You said paranoid schizophrenia. 
right? Yeah, yes. You diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia in December of 2020. Well, when we say par paranoid is, is an adjective, it describes certain characteristics of the schizophrenic process. Right. And but paranoid, it's schizophrenia. Paranoid schizophrenia no longer exists in the DSM-5, does it? Right. Mm -hmm. But in December of 2020, you told me that that was your diagnosis. Well, I'm a psychologist. I've been doing this a long time. Okay. So, so you're allowed there, there, to forget things? What's that? You're allowed to forget things because you've been doing this a long time? Is that my, what, is that but my forgetting is not cons of any consequence. The fact that I didn't use the term paranoid, I mentioned the term paranoid as I described the symptomatology of Mr. Mr. Lloyd. So if you want to blow that out of proportion as if it were meaningful, whether you call, diagnose someone paranoid schizophrenic uh, or just schizophrenic, uh, schizophrenic chronic paranoid, uh, peripatetically inclined ambulatory schizophrenic, however you want, whatever adjective you want to use, you feel free to use. Uh, when I talked about Mr. Lloyd, I was talking about his schizophrenia. I talked about the fact that, uh, that uh, he was paranoid. I talked about the fact that he was delusional. You, you also felt comfortable with the paranoid schizophrenia diagnosis because you had relied on Dr. Sesta's report, right? No. No? No. Again, do you remember me deposing you back in December of 2020? Sure. And do you recall telling me back then? Sure, page 100, line 22. <laughs> do you remember telling me back then? Just give him a minute, Mr. Um, Brian. Mr. Williams, sorry. Brian. Go ahead. <clears throat> do you remember telling me back then about, and I'll let you see it if you'd like to, uh, about Dr. Sesta's diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, you do remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you would agree that you relied, in part, on Dr. Sesta's diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia for Mr. Lloyd? Sure. Mm -hmm. Did you know, doctor, that Dr. Sesta didn't diagnose um, Mr. Lloyd with paranoid schizophrenia? Uh, Are you aware of that? Dr. Sesta, uh, let's see. Dr. Sesta di di uh, diagnosed him as a, with a psychotic disorder, delusional disorder, uh, grandiose persecutory symptomatology, thought dysfunction, and uh, SLD. Right. Uh, specific but you learning told disability. me in December of 2022 that you were relying upon his diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, maybe. I, I don't recall. When, in fact, he didn't diagnose him with that at all. Okay, right? that's fine. In fact, he specifically ruled it out. I don't recall. Would looking at a copy of his report that you reviewed earlier help no, you because, remember that? No, because if I looked at, when I say I relied upon, or uh, I reviewed someone's findings, uh, my findings could be different. I didn't base my findings on his. I reached my findings independently of his. The fact that he had, that he did that, that he found, found that, uh, how he reached that conclusion, that's, that's what he reached as an expert, as an expert. You also told me earlier, <clears throat> Dr. Um, Toomer, that you reviewed the reports of Dr. Michael Mayer, right? Correct, uh-huh. And you also, I believe, reviewed his testimony at the prior trial. Correct, uh-huh. Right? Uh, and you adopted his findings as well. I believe so, yes, uh-huh. Okay. Are you aware, Doctor, that Dr. Mayer didn't die? Dr. Mayer found Mr. Lloyd to be sane at the time of this crime? Mm -hmm. I believe so, yes. I'm sorry. So you adopted his findings, including his finding that he was sane at the time of this offense? Objection. Overruled. Now, you're mixing apples and oranges. No, no, hold no, on. You, no, let okay, me finish. Then you, you can explain that one for the me. question, Mr. You, you're mixing apples and oranges. I looked at what he provided in terms of information. I, the fact that he didn't reach the same conclusions, uh, experts oftentimes uh, uh, go through the, uh, the process that I have described for you. And we oftentimes discuss our findings. 
we do not necessarily discuss our conclusions. So the fact that he reached a conclusion or I reached a conclusion different from his does not mean that I in some way, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't respect or don't uh, read and review his, his particular findings. Do you so, recall what you told me about your adoption of Dr. Mayer's findings back in December of 2020? I just answered that question. No. Do you recall what you told me about that? I think, I, if I recall, no, I don't recall right offhand. Okay. Would but I remember. Would a copy of your deposition help you remember? If you would like to, yes. Please. Page, nine. Page 105, starting at line 10 through lines 17. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. <clears throat> Start, you can read the whole thing if you want, but line 10 through line 17. Line 10 through line 17? Yes, sir. Okay. It sounds like you're adopting the opinions of doctors. To yourself, Sester. I'm sorry. Read it to yourself, please. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. That's I okay. I didn't specify. It it's my fault. This is what I just said. So this is just a repetition okay. of what I just mentioned. If that's your view, then please read what you said, lines 10 through 17, to the members of the jury. Okay, lines 10 through 17. Uh, question, it sounds like you are adopting the opinions of doctors Sesta, Campbell, Dunn, and Mayer. Uh, yeah, because they're, and the question is, is that correct? Uh, and, and my answer is, their findings. Their findings are consistent, or should I say, my clinical data. Okay. My clinical assessment, the data that I derived, is consistent with their findings from the testing. Right. That's what I just said. So, Dr. Mayer says that Mr. Lloyd was insane, or excuse me, sane, at the time of this crime. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of that, but that, I just answered the question. That has nothing to do with my conclusions. Judge, You're talking about Ms. Dr. Mayer's findings, no. not my conclusions. Then why did you say you were adopting them? Not now. Go ahead. I said that I was, that I had considered, I had reviewed, I considered his, his uh, conclusions, I mean his, uh, his findings. I'm, I'm not, when I say I adopted, if I did say that, that's a, a bad choice of, poor choice of words. What I'm simply saying is, I looked at his report, I looked at his testing, there was nothing inconsistent or inappropriate about his testing, so I reviewed, and yes, I did adopt his, his findings. I did not adopt his conclusions. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you. 